Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, this is an Easter for the record books. The first Easter in any of our memories when we've not been able to gather and worship together. But despite that fact, despite the fact that we are in different places today, the hope of Easter, the promise of Easter, the love of Easter, the mercy and grace of Easter is ours more than it has ever been. Hold fast to those truths and those promises through these days, and we shall celebrate when we are together again. I'm grateful to uh, Shelly and Alex, Randy and Chuck for being here in the sanctuary so that we can record a service for you in this beautiful place. I trust that it will draw us together in ways that are still meaningful to us, though we cannot be here in person on Easter morning. Well, it is good to be together. Scripture today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in the 
accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me, whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today you will hear two accounts of the resurrection. There are five of them in the New Testament. The first of them First to be written is the one that you just heard from Paul the Apostle to the Corinthian Christians. He wrote of not so much about the resurrection itself and the events of Easter morning, but he wrote, Paul wrote of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, including the one to himself. Now we turn to the Gospel of John, the latest of the resurrection accounts to be written, not written until actually almost the end of the first century. This is also a remarkable story, not like the others. John chapter 20, the first 18 verses. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means my teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The gospel of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It had been the worst summer drought in centuries. 
Fields were parched and brown. Crops lay wilting, almost gone. People were anxious and irritable in the little farming community as they looked to the sky for any sign of relief. Days turned into arid weeks and no rain came. The pastors of the churches called for an hour of prayer one day in the town square. Everyone was to come and to bring with them an object of faith for inspiration. At high noon on the appointed day, the townspeople and the farmers turned out in great numbers, filling the square with anxious faces and hopeful hearts. The pastors were touched to see the people and all that they brought, Bibles and prayer books and crosses and rosaries. When the hour of prayer ended, just as the last amen was spoken, as if on command, a soft rain began to fall. Cheers swept the crowd as they held their treasured crosses and Bibles over their heads. From the middle of the crowd, though, from the middle of the crowd, one faith symbol seemed to overshadow all the others. A little girl, nine years old, had brought with her an umbrella. She brought an umbrella. Now she's the one who really believed. Here we are at Easter again, called upon today to believe, and for the rest of the year, to let our believing make a difference in the ways that we order our lives, the ways that we live. It isn't easy. It never was. It is the church's grandest festival, our highest celebration, the heart of our Christian faith, the festival of the resurrection, which we call Easter. Festive music and flowers and new clothes, all those things that we associate with Easter, which when we are able to gather again, we will see them that day where we are going to have a grand Easter celebration again this year when we come together. But this morning's gospel stands in stark contrast to that high celebration. It is John's account of the Easter story, and John's telling of the story is quiet and subdued. There is some, some running of people back and forth to the tomb, but the overall tone of the text is calm and restrained, tranquil rather than triumph. There are no angelic messengers, no shouts of he is ridden, risen, no hallelujahs in John's story. It's a rather matter-of-fact account. It begins early on Sunday morning, still dark. One lone woman makes her way to the tomb. Suddenly she stops because in the gray, hazy light of pre-dawn, she sees that the stone in front of the tomb has been moved aside. Hurriedly she turns and seeks out the disciples to tell them. So it begins. Three people participate in the drama that follows. Three people visit the tomb, and each of their reactions is different. First is Mary Magdalene. She goes alone. And when she sees the stone has been moved, she jumps to the conclusion that someone has come during the night and stolen the body of her friend Jesus. She is not moved to faith early that Easter morning, but she is moved to fear. The second person is Peter. Mary finds him with another disciple and tells them the terrible news. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter is shocked, certainly, but he says not a word. He and the other disciple run for the tomb. The other fellow is a faster runner, and he gets to the open tomb before Peter does, but he doesn't go in. When Peter arrives, though, he barges right into the tomb without hesitation, only to find it empty. There's no body there indeed, just as Mary has said, only the linen wrappings lying where the body had been. But here's the amazing thing. 
Those things, the things that Peter discovered, the things that Mary discovered, had no significance for her. Mary had spoken the truth, so Peter supposed. Jesus' body is gone, and we don't know where it is. So Peter is not moved to faith by what he saw. He was perplexed. The third person in that early morning drama, the beloved disciple, traditionally identified as John. He follows Peter into the tomb, and the text reports he saw and believed. Of the three, he was the only one who realized what had happened. Jesus' body had not been stolen, but he had risen from the dead. Why was this beloved disciple the only one? Why didn't the other two see and understand and believe as John did? The fact of the matter is, believing in the resurrection of Jesus has never been easy. It wasn't easy on that first Easter morning, and it isn't easy now. After such a cruel crucifixion and an agonizing death and a hasty burial, one does not expect to find the glorious transformation of resurrection. It wasn't easy for the disciples who had lived out that drama to believe it. It wasn't easy for early Christians to proclaim it. And it isn't easy for those of us who look back at it through 2,000 years of history either. The resurrection of Jesus was a unique and singular event in history. It cannot be repeated or re-examined or compared to any other thing that has ever happened. When Jesus was crucified, the hillside of Golgotha was swelling with people. Perhaps there were even hundreds who witnessed with their own eyes the brutal act of, ex of execution. Crucifixion was a most public event. The Romans wanted it that way. But nobody saw the resurrection. No one saw the stone being rolled aside and the buried body of Jesus emerged from the tomb. All the first witnesses saw was a stone out of place and an empty grave and a pile of discarded grave clothes. So is that it? Are we left with only this to stand upon? On this, this sketchy account to build the faith of a lifetime upon? No, not at all. It has never been so that a visit to an empty tomb is the way that one comes to faith. The best evidence we have of the resurrection is not an empty tomb. It is rather the testimony of the disciples and of the church that faith is not built upon a visit to an empty tomb, but our resurrection faith is founded upon the change that Jesus has made in our lives. It is not encountering, it is not entering an empty tomb, but encountering the living Lord that produced then and still produces now a confident faith in the resurrection of Jesus, our Savior. Martin Luther hit the nail on the head centuries ago when he said, we do not believe in the resurrection because of the empty tomb, but because of the Christ-filled world. We are led to faith not by experiencing a year-by-year -year return to the empty tomb and struggling to make sense of it. We, like all the faithful people in history, come to faith by encountering the living Lord in our own lives, week by week, day by day. It is not understanding the empty tomb and how it got that way, but encountering the living Christ that creates in us a resurrection faith. This is disturbing to us. 20th century Americans with our scientific and technological sensibilities. But there's no proving of the resurrection, not by sacred stories or detailed descriptions. There are no shrouds or other relics that can prove to us that it really happened, as the scripture says. The empty tomb, in fact, caused more fear than faith. But those same people were transformed when they encountered the resurrected Lord. Karl Barth was one of the 20th century's most remarkable churchmen. He once was asked, why do people come to church? And Barth answered, people come to church to ask the question, is it true?
true, I suspect that's particularly the case on Easter. Is it true? I have heard that there is a loving God who created this universe and is even yet moving around in it. I've heard that because God so loved the world, he sent his own child to save us from our foolishness and from death. I've heard that I can trust my life and the lives of those whom I love into God's care. I have heard that good is stronger than evil and that life is stronger than death. Is it true? Is it really true? Can I count on it? Just like it happened 2,000 years ago. People will not find satisfying answers to their questions in an empty tomb or even in words on a page or in engaging stories, no matter how convincing they are. They will find their answer in a genuine encounter with the living Christ. And that's not some mystical event, but it occurs when the Christ in them meets the Christ in you and me. It is not an empty tomb or an ancient shroud or ghost-like apparitions, but it is the Christ-filled world that results in faith in Jesus' resurrection. This is the message of Easter, and this is the meaning of the resurrection. It is not casting out all fears and doubts, nor is it the promise of no darkness and no difficulty. Rather, it is the assurance, Easter is the assurance, that because Jesus lives, we are not alone. On Easter, we proclaim with confidence and assurance, Christ is risen from the dead. We are certain, we know, not because we've seen an empty tomb or examined discarded grave cloths, grave clothes. We are certain because Jesus is with us now, leading us, guiding us, forgiving and transforming us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
My friends, at this moment, the world is struggling and suffering. And there are many, not only in our nation, but in all the nations of the world, who are in grief because of the losses they are experiencing, the death that is washing over our world. But all is not lost, for we have this faith, this confidence. We have this Easter faith that though we may be in mourning and in grief, in fear and struggling to remain hopeful, Christ is with us because he's risen, risen from the dead, and he will remain with us throughout all the ages, through all the events of our lives. The Christ in you is encountering the Christ in others, even now. And that is what convinces us and the world that Christ lives. It's not a mystical experience at all. It is Christ being encountered in the human family, in the ways that we show love and kindness and joy and hope and mercy to others. Receive the risen Christ today. Let him live in and through you. Thank you.